welcome everybody here this morning. Um, got a few announcements, and uh, it's good to have a bulletin back. You know, everybody get a bulletin. Yeah. If you didn't, we got some out front out there, so it's good to have that. Um, thank you, Miss Gladys, for getting that th this week. Um, the announcements we have this morning was um, remember the uh, Methodist Church tonight for the community. Um, Supper and sing and uh, whatnot, Miss Belinda and Mr. Hunter, and I know several others, Miss Cherie, Miss Sally, Miss Doris, yeah, Miss Ann, I know all going to be there and sing for us tonight. Um, another thing we have, and that's at 5.30 tonight, remember that. Um, and then uh, we thank Brother Josiah for helping out today. Gonna lead our music. Remember, uh, Brother Cody, his daughters are sick, so uh, y'all remember him in your prayers. And uh, I think Miss Doris has an announcement she wants to make. All right, for y'all who didn't hear, uh, Miss Doris, uh, the second week in February, we're going to start back Sunday school, and uh, she's looking for any helpers and teachers and whatnot. So uh, the other thing I have, uh, we have some Light and Moon Christmas offering envelopes. If you don't have one in a pew in front of you or need one, um, if you'll raise your hand, I'll get one to you in just a minute, and uh, we're going to do that walk here pretty soon. Uh, after the third hymn. After the third hymn, and then after the second hymn, we're going to be voting on our church budget. I've started handing out some. If you are a member of the church, if you will raise your hand, I'll finish getting the rest of them to you when we get started. All right, Miss Ruby, I'll get one to you. And I hadn't get any of this side hardly. But uh, that's all the announcements I got. The Stroud three over here can get started. So. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, as mentioned, I'm the substitute Cody today. Um, uh, if you cannot hear in my voice, I'm actually recovering myself from some sickness, so my voice is going to be cracking throughout this whole thing, so I just appreciate your grace in advance, so y'all just sing out all the more, because uh, I love hearing y'all's voices anyway, so if y'all stand with us as we begin singing, Angels We Have Heard On High.
continue singing, we'll come down long expecting Jesus. Is this a talented family or what? Uh, this is wonderful. Thank you all for leading us in worship today, all of you. Uh, Brother Cody did call, and he, uh, his daughter is sick, and he's afraid it might be something contagious. And so I appreciate so much you guys filling in and, and helping us out. Let me make a couple of promotions and announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, an announcement is a very helpful thing for all of us as church members. Two of our church members have been honored at Webb Elementary School. Uh, Cindy Bowie has been chosen as Teacher of the Year, and Becky Taylor, Support Person of the Year. So we're proud of both of these very much and uh, their accomplishments. I want us to uh, have the uh, vote on our uh, budget and I'm going to ask for help with that. But before we do that, let me uh, mention something about our Lottie Moon offering this morning. Our Lottie Moon Christmas offering is a international mission offering. And all of that goes for international missions, every penny we give. And you say, well, how is the budget figured? Uh, the budget for our international missions is about $350 million a year. One half comes through the cooperative program, one half through Light of Moon Christmas offering. Last year, we as Southern Baptists gave more for international missions than we've ever given before. And this year, our goal is $186 million, and our church goal is $1,500. You say $1,500 is a long way from $186 million. Well, yes, but there are also 45,000 churches, so we, and some churches, are much larger churches, there are a few. First Baptist Church in Midland, Texas, First Baptist Church Orlando, they give over a million a year for Lottie Moon in their churches. So uh, I believe we'll reach that goal and we want to do our part. Now we also have another goal today and that is that at least 60 of us give something. At least 60 of us give something and that includes the children. And then later on in the service, we're going to give you the opportunity to come forward and, and bring your gift, your envelope. But I want to make sure everyone has one. Uh, do you all have those? If you would, just bring those forward. And uh, well, here's some right here. Uh, bring, come forward with those. 
And let's make sure everybody, penny, nickel, dime, $100, $1,000, whatever you give, uh, we want you to use an envelope because we want 60 people to give. And if you would, uh, if you don't have an envelope, go ahead and take one. As the guys come by, uh, raise your hand and let them give you one. Go ahead and take one. Get one for the children too. We want everybody to give something. Later on in the service, we're going to be uh, uh, bringing forth our Lottie Moon offering gifts at that time. Thank you for being a part of this. Again, we want every child. If a child is beside you and doesn't have any money with them, uh, give them a loan. Give them a loan, okay? A uh, little usury. Give them a loan today. Or maybe even a gift that they can put in their uh, international mission envelope because we want everybody to give and be a part of this with a goal of 60 to give. We're going to ask our counters after we have uh, the voting on our church budget today and after we do our uh, international mission giving, we're going to ask our counters to count the gifts and the vote and at the end of the service to come back and give us a report. So before we leave today, we'll, we'll know about both of those. Now let's uh, take care of our ballots on our church budget. Guys, if you would come forward with the ballots, just come forward. And uh, now they've come forward with the ballots. And uh, then as they come back down the aisle, just raise your hand if you need one. As they come back down the aisle, just raise your hand if you need one. This is for uh, our church members. All right, as they come back down the aisle there, just raise your hand if you need one, okay? This is for all of our church members to be voting on our budget for this year. Copies of these have been made available. Wednesday night we had discussion on this. Uh, raise your hand again now if you need a, uh, a ballot for the uh, budget. Just raise your hand. We discussed the budget uh, Wednesday evening and had good discussion on it. And today would be, of course, the uh, yes or no uh, vote on the ballot. Anytime we vote on the budget, I, I've always taken it very seriously. Uh, took it seriously for a lot of reasons, not the least of which all of my life and all of my ministry through Baptist, uh, my family and I have been taken care of. Uh, Baptist helped educate me, helped pay for my education. Baptist helped me uh, in my marriage and my family, helped my children have an education. So anytime I was in a church and they voted on the budget, hey, it affected me personally. But also I knew it affected missionaries around the world. And I also knew it affected the program of the church. So budgets are very important. Let's have a word of prayer about this budget vote. Our Father, we thank you for giving to us that we might give to others. As we vote on our budget today, our Father, we take it seriously. We want a budget that honors Jesus Christ. We want a budget that uh, underpins uh, the growth of the church, the work of the church. We want a budget, our Father, that has outreach, concern for others. As we vote on this budget today, help us to be a part, not only of the vote, but a part of the giving. May we commit ourselves today uh, to tithes and offerings this year in supporting the work of the Lord Jesus here at Webb Baptist Church and throughout the world. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, I'm, uh, if you would mark your ballots, and then we have a plate here. We can start taking those up. Uh, We'll, we'll take up the ballots now. There might be another plate there in the back that we could use if somebody would get it. Someone was kind enough to caution us last Sunday night, and I, I want to be a part of that caution, too. When we go for the 530 service today, you be careful. If you have to park across Highway 52, you be very careful about crossing that highway, okay? And if I get...
parked on the uh, wrong side. I, I'm going to be careful as I cross too. So, but it'll be dark by then, and we just don't want any of our people or anyone harmed. As they say, always drive careful because the life you save may be a Baptist tither. So that's the way I said the person you harm could be a Baptist tither. So you be careful. All right, we've uh, had that vote. Let's let's have a hymn, and then we'll do our. I mean. We'll continue singing with What Child Is This?
right, we will have one more hymn before we have a special in the message, and that song will be Worthy, You Are Worthy. Luke 2 begins uh, speaking about Joseph and Mary traveling to Bethlehem to be counted in the census. And uh, they found a place to stay. And verse 6 says, While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And verse 7 and and she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. Um, I can only imagine what it was like for Mary. You know, she was by herself, but the Lord God was there with her and uh, he took care of all details that was needed for the birth and when baby Jesus was born uh, I can imagine that she took him in her arms and she examined his body making sure that everything uh, was uh, good and it was and after that, maybe she uh, uh, just was holding him close. And I wonder if uh, she might have grabbed his hand and uh, maybe he wrapped uh, his, his hand around her finger. And I wonder, uh, you know, I don't know that Mary might have known that uh, how Jesus would die, 
but that hand would be one of the hands that would uh, be pierced with a nail and uh, he would give himself to save us from our sins and I'm so grateful that I know he's my savior and uh, uh, I would invite you today if you don't know Jesus as your savior to make that decision and you'll never ever ever regret it. One, two, three, four, five little fingers on his hand. Son of God, Mary's little man. He was born in a manger, gentle as a lamb. My heart's in the five little fingers of his hand. There was no room in the inn when they came to Bethlehem in a stable baby came little Jesus was his name one two three four five little fingers on his head son of god mary's little man he was born in a manger gentle as a lamb my heart's in the five little fingers of his hand Jesus came to save the world, man and woman, boy and girl. So bow before him and sing his praise and for his blessings count the ways. One, two, three, four, five little fingers on his hand. Son of God, Mary's little man. He was born in a manger, gentle as a lamb. My heart's in the five little fingers of his hand. My heart's in the five little fingers of his hand. Well, and all the people said, amen. amen. It's good. Thank you, Pam, Belinda, uh, Josiah, and Jacob. Thank you all for leading us in worship today. Children be going to uh, children's worship. Good to see you guys today, and thank you, workers, for working with them. Thank you so much. Let's see. The, uh, have the sermon sheets been passed out? Uh, they have. Okay, good. I, when I'm on the front row, I can't always know what's going on behind me. <laughs> Matthew, the first chapter, 
uh, in the month of December, I've been preaching about the birth of Jesus, and I'll continue to even uh, next Sunday, post-Christmas, and I'll be uh, using text from Matthew. And today is Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 to 25. I'll be reading from today's English version, or Good News for Modern Man. And uh, if yours may read a little differently, but uh, but not very much so. It's, it's pretty close to the major text. The birth of Jesus Christ, uh, Matthew 1, 18 and 25. This is the way that Jesus Christ was born. Uh, Pam, I had not ever heard that song before that uh, that explained it very well and very personable too. That was great. But this is the way that Jesus Christ was born. His mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, but before they were married, she found out that she was going to have a baby by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a man who always did what was right, but he did not want to disgrace Mary publicly so he made plans to break the engagement secretly. While he was thinking about all of this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, descendant of David, do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for it is by the Holy Spirit that she has conceived. She will give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this happened, in order to make come true what the Lord has said through the prophet. The virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had told him to do and married Mary. But he had no sexual relations with her before she gave birth to her son, and Joseph named him Jesus. And this is the word of God and blessed be the name of the Lord. What is it in a name that's important? I taught school for college, university for about 20 years, four different schools, and I had something unusual happen one time. I had a class to turn in a semesters of work in a folder. And on the folder, they were, it was eight and a half by 11 folder, they were to place their project work, and on the tab of the folder, they were to write their name. And uh, all the folders were handed in, and I had them in my office, and I was just looking over them. And uh, they all looked good. You know, if you got spell check and uh, word processing, they all ought to look good. And they all looked good. And, fi and I finally came to one, though, that, wow. I said, what's going on here? It uh, just scribbly. And uh, on the tab where the name was supposed to be. And then I opened up the folder and you know, inside again, it was just uh, rough notes. And uh, some, you could tell there were some reading notations and some ideas scribbled in and written in. I said, whoa, now wait a minute. What is all this? Somebody's not done what they were supposed to do. And I got to looking for his name. His name was supposed to be on the tab. And uh, I couldn't even read the name on the tab. And I said, whoa, somebody's not going to make the grade they're expecting here. And again, all these scribbly notes in this folder, a lot of notes were in there, but they were just scribbly notes and they weren't completed like the uh, other folders. And I couldn't even read the name on the tab. And I said, well, I'm going to figure out who this student is because I'm going to call him in and talk to him. And I got to looking at the tab more closely to see what the name was. And I finally figured it out. There's two words, rough draft. The student had accidentally turned in a rough draft. And I was looking for a name, so I called him rough draft from then on. Now, where did you get your name? As Anglo-Americans, our name came primarily from four sources. Our names came from occupation. The name Carpenter. Uh, maybe you know some people by these names. Their, the names came from occupations. Carpenter, farmer, shepherd, baker, tanner, weaver. These are all occupations. 
and, and other occupation names. And our names also came from location. Hill and dale and rivers, forests, brooks, and so forth. But our names also came from avocation. Fisher, hunter, weaver, thrower, walker, from various avocations. And our also our name came from colors. You ever known anybody known named green? Or brown or black or white or gray? Names came from colors. Names mean something. And in the day of Jesus, in this text, an angel told Joseph, when the child is born, name him Jesus, because he is to save his people from their sins. His name meant something. When they heard the name Jesus, it meant something. Many times I've heard missionaries, international missionaries tell this, that after they have worked in a village for a while, they become known as the Jesus person. The Jesus person, man or woman. Uh, the villagers begin to call them the Jesus person. Because why? Because they introduce them to Jesus who can save them from their sins. In this text, Jesus was named before he was born. An angel told Joseph, name him Jesus. Jesus is his name. Christ is his title. Rabbi was a teacher was his designation. And Lord is his majesty, Jesus Christ, Lord. When Jesus was born, notice the three actions that took place in this text, very important actions. First of all, note the courage of Joseph. A marriage in that day was not like a marriage in our day. A marriage in that day really was in three steps. First of all, there was engagement. Then there was the betrothal, and then there was the marriage. Now, the engagement might have happened when the couple were children. Their parents might have set up their being married when they were small children. Or it could have been a matchmaker. They could have hired a matchmaker to come in and to find a match for their uh, child, even when they were young. Now, that was the engagement. But the engagement could be broken. If a bride, when she became marriageable age, did not choose to uh, marry that person, she, she could break off the engagement. She could break off the engagement. Now, the male could too. But uh, once they got to the betrothal section, that was different. The betrothal was more than an engagement. To them, to be in betrothed to one another was a promise that we we're going to be married, and they were married in every way except they did not live together during that period. A betrothal period was about a year. So Mary and Joseph became engaged. And then they became betrothed. And this, and this is when Joseph found out that Mary was, was with child. And this is when uh, he found out that uh, she had uh, been with child. He knew that the child was not his physically. But the Bible says that he was a man who did not want to cause her difficulty, he wanted to figure out a way that she would not be disgraced. According to Deuteronomy 22, 23, she could have been stoned. In the betrothal period, she was, she was married and everything except them living together. And so she could have been stoned. And Joseph looked for a way, a private way, that she would not have to marry him, him, her, because of what was going on. And then the angel visited and said, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary for your wife, for it is by the Holy Spirit that she has conceived. By the Holy Spirit, the virgin birth. Now note the courage of Joseph. He had to go against uh, the mores of the community. He had to go against the gossip of the community. He had to go against tradition. But he was willing to do what? He was willing to listen to the word that came from the Lord through that angel. He had that kind of courage. We think that Joseph died when Jesus was quite young. And of course, Jesus was the oldest child. The Catholic Church teaches that none of the other children uh, uh, belonged to uh, Joseph and Mary, but they were adopted. 
uh, that Mary had uh, perpetual virginity. She had no more children. According to the New Testament, uh, Jesus had brothers, had three brothers and at least two sisters because it's plural. And so according to the New Testament, yes, Jesus did have half brothers and sisters uh, through Joseph and Mary. So you can ima imagine the courage that it took to take Mary as his wife when all of society was against his doing that. But notice something else. Notice the commitment of Mary. It comes through in Matthew, but it comes through more clearly in Luke. After Mary, when, when the angel came and told her that Jesus was going to be born of her through the Holy Spirit, she said, how can that be? I've not known man. I've not had sexual relations. How, how can it happen? And the angel said, get this verse, with God, nothing is impossible. And Mary, not knowing what to do or what to say, she threw herself on the mercy and grace of God, and she said, you do with your handmaid as you choose to do, according to Luke 138. But if you, cho if you look at that verse a little more carefully, it's interesting what it says. The word is really female slave. She didn't say handmaid. She said female slave. She said, Lord, I am your female slave. I will do whatever you want me to do. It took courage for Joseph to do what he did, but it took commitment for Mary to be willing to do what she did. She, she had great commitment to him. There was a time uh, in the life of Mary when she saw the crucifixion coming. And uh, she let out a cry that uh, kind of goes through the ages. There was a young man who was a grader for me uh, when I was teaching. Uh, he graded papers for me. And he became a uh, youth director in the church and was ordained. Uh, he was from Indiana. And his mother and father and grandmother and others, brothers, came down for the ordination service. His grandmother played the piano. His mother sang a special. His, one of his brothers led the singing. It was really a, a family affair for his ordination service. But when it came time for him to kneel and people to come by and place their hands on him and to let him know that they supported him and would pray for him in his ministry, I was sitting on the front row and uh, watching, but, but not paying close attention, but watching. But when his mother got to him, she placed her hands on his head. And by the way, I have this on video because they made videotape of the service, and I kept that video. She, she laid her hands on her son's head, and she let out a cry. I don't mean a scream, but she let out a cry that really went deep into my heart and to the heart of other people. And we all felt like she saw something. And I told her son this. He's now pastor uh, in Apopka, Florida, and, and rather significant church. And I told him, I said, when, when your mother laid hands on you, I know you heard that cry that came from her. And then that's the only person that came through that line that you heard a sound from. But she saw something, and she knew something about the ministry of his life that he was going to need all the love and support and concern and compassion that could be put there. And I, and I see this. Mary saw something in Jesus. She always saw something in Jesus. The rest of the family did not see and that other people did not see. And a cry would go out from her sometimes because she saw what was coming. The courage of Joseph, the commitment of Mary. But notice also the calling of Jesus. The calling of Jesus. The Old Testament says he will be Emmanuel, God with us. The book of Isaiah says uh, that a virgin will conceive and bring forth uh, Emmanuel. And the word means Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus was called to be Savior. Jesus was called to be Lord. His name was Jesus because of his calling. He saved us when we came to him and asked for forgiveness and salvation. It was in a revival meeting in this church that I made my public profession of faith. 
And the church building at that time, I was approximately here, but out to the uh, west side, there was a pump house uh, where we had all of our water supply and all that. And uh, after the uh, service that night, uh, John Smith, a uh, pastor from Villarica, Georgia, preaching a revival meeting, some of us were walking out toward that pump house. And I remember turning to a friend of mine who'd also made his profession of faith that night, Dawson Burnham. And I said, Dawson, there's something different about this night. There's something different that's going on in my life right now. I can't explain it. I mean, I was young. And I told my friend Dawson, I can't explain it. But there's something different in my life now. Jesus was called to save us. And we call out to him in repentance for forgiveness. His name is Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. Years ago, there was a young girl born in Tuscumbia, Alabama. Her name was Helen Kelly. Uh, Jeremy and I have visited her birthplace in Tuscumbia. Uh, and we have heard the stories about her family and so forth. I've read about her and her biographies and so forth, and autobiography. A rather interesting thing happened. When she was born, she was as any other child, but when she was about a year old, a disease or, or some illness struck her that took away her sight and her hearing. So when she was just two years of age, she could not see nor hear nor, of course, speak. And she was like, uh, according to the family record, uh, she was nearly like an animal. Sometimes they would put a collar on her and just put her on the clothesline and let's just let her run around and play in the yard because otherwise she would hurt herself and they didn't know what to do with her. But when she was nine years of age, the family who had some wealth found out about a place in Boston called the Perkins Institute that trained workers to work with children like her. They got in touch with this institute in Boston, and that's when Ann Sullivan came and lived in their home in Tuscumbia and trained Helen, trained her eventually to speak, even though she could not hear and she could not see. They trained her to speak. Uh, they trained her by signing uh, in her hand. It first started by a thunderstorm came up, and of course Helen didn't know what was going on. She could feel the vibration of the uh, thunder and, and the lightning and all going on, but she didn't know. And Ann Sullivan would pump water, pump, their pump is still there. She'd pump water on her hand and sign water. And Helen would jerk her hand away and Ann would grab her hand and pump and pump water on her hand and sign water. And all of a sudden, uh, that little girl signed water back. And Ann knew that they'd begun to communicate and that's how she began teaching her. And at 11 years of age, they realized that nobody had told Helen about God. And Anne said, I don't know that I can do it the way it should be done. But she said, I know a preacher, a pastor in Boston. And his name is Phillips Brooks. By the way, the same Phillips Brooks that wrote Old Little Town of Bethlehem. He loved children. He wrote that song for children. And she said, I know Dr. Brooks in Boston, and if we'll take Helen to her, he can tell her, I'll sign, and he can tell her about Jesus because we want it done the best way possible. So they did. They took Helen to Boston, got an appointment with Phillips Brooks. He sat down with Helen, with Ann uh, signing for him, and told Helen Keller for the first time in her life the good news of Jesus Christ. In her autobiography, it's interesting to me how she responded. She said, I knew he was there. I just didn't know his name. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. For he saves his people from their sins. Let's bow our heads, please, in prayer. Bow our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Uh, let me ask you something. Do you know this Jesus as your personal Savior? Do you know this Jesus as Lord of your life? You can. You can. By asking Jesus Christ to come into your life, to forgive you of your sins, 
and to save you. Asking him to come into your life, to give you your sins. And as you repent and, and turn from your sins, the grace of God floods your life with salvation because Jesus saves. It may be you're here today and you've not made that first time decision for Christ and followed him in commitment with a church fellowship or church membership or baptism. We invite you to make that decision and make it public today that you want to follow Jesus. You know his name. Jesus saves. You want to follow Jesus as Lord of your life. Maybe you're here today and you need a church home. Uh, your church membership is someplace else, but you live here now. Maybe you want to come and join this fellowship today. We invite you to do that, to come from a uh, like church of belief and order, and we invite you to come into this fellowship today and join us. In just a moment, we're going to sing a hymn, and as we sing that hymn, I'll stand down front, and I invite you to come and, and make your public decision today. Let's stand, please, if you would. Let's stand.